I see tracks reading. Yes! In 1982, Franklin Computer released the ACE 100, an Apple II Plus compatible computer. It was so compatible, it used the actual Apple II ROMs and boot disks. A few months later, Franklin released a larger machine, the ACE 1000, with a full-size keyboard and extra interior space for expansion. Within months, Apple Computer sued Franklin for copyright infringement. It was the first major case to test copyright law in the computer age. Franklin argued that since Apple's software existed only in machine-readable form and contained no copyright notices, it could be freely copied. Apple eventually forced Franklin out of business. I picked up this Ace 1000 about a year back, but haven't had a chance to really look at it. Let's see if we can get it up and running. This Ace came with Franklin's 12-inch green monitor. This one seems okay, but has a bit of a blemish on the case. Rather than mess with an old CRT, I decided to just use an LCD monitor for now. All the Apple and Apple clones use a composite video output. This old compact monitor will do the trick. It has a pair of DVI ports, a VGA port, a 9-pin and 15-pin video, an S-video, and a composite. Perfect. This Ace 1000 has a single external drive and an analog controller. Let's look inside. This is my first look at this machine's internals. Sockets are all good. And looks like our joystick cable right there. Yep, that's good. Socket. Oh, ready to that. That says game right there. Awesome. So that's the analog joystick. Given that this has video cable, it's jacked into auxiliary video here, and this says text GR for graphics. I'm going to guess this is an 80 column board. These were really necessary for when running on CPM or similar, so this is good. No real identifiers on here, but I think we're pretty safe on that one, so we'll come back to that. These early machines had no bracketing on the back, so the, the boards are free-floating, so you have to be a little bit careful with that. This is obviously the floppy controller. So I'm going to detangle this a little bit. The standard controller here, nothing exciting. Each of these controllers could handle two drives. That's a little bent up. Somebody torqued a uh, connector out of that one. This is Franklin computer on it. Good. All right, that's good. These machines supported multiple disk controllers. So I ran one that had four drives on it. So two controllers. Let's see what we got here. That's a soft card. Well, now that's interesting. So this is a Microsoft soft card. It was a coprocessor board you could put into Apple computers that carried a second CPU. See it right there, Z80A, 1981. You could use these to run stuff that wasn't 6502 based, like CPM. But here's the funny thing. In this machine, there's also this guy, which I recognize. This is an Ace 80 board. Ace 80 also has a Z80 on it. This was the CPM board that Franklin made for all their machines. It carries another, I think this is 16K of RAM over here, Z80 CPU. And this is basically an entire second computer inside the Franklin. Now, why there are two of these, that's very interesting. I'm really looking forward to seeing why you would have two. Let's put this back. And this guy, Pretty sure it's just a RAM expansion board. 
given that it's socketed into the RAM bank here. This says auto start ROM copyright Apple 1976-1978 Applesoft ROM Apple 1978. Well, isn't that interesting? And this guy, let's take this out and take a look at it real quick. Yep. This says fourth dimension systems card. Not a lot of other information on that. I'll look that one up. Now I'm going to throw caution to the wind here. Power connector. Let's try and see what happens. No smoke yet. Good. It's open. Ace 1000. It just made all the correct noises. Hitting reset, and we have a prompt. It works. Now that we've established basic ROM-based stuff is working, let's try to boot a floppy. I formatted this disk for a different project a while back. Let's see if it boots. I was always taught to never power on a computer with a floppy in the drive. Older machines would basically trash the disk on power up. So the sequence is put the disk in, power it up, and then close the drive door. To be honest, I was quite surprised it booted up on the first try. Maybe we lucked out and have a perfectly functional machine here. The next step was to bring in my floppy EMU. This emulator, made by the folks at Big Mesa Wires, can be used on most old Apple computers, Macs included. It emulates the five and a quarter inch floppies I'm using here but without all the variables such as drive alignment, dirty disk heads, stuff like that. It has a micro SD card and can hold hundreds of disk images. The EMU board plugs into the disk controller just like a floppy drive would. From the computer's perspective, there's really no difference. And this is where I hit my first problem. The ACE recognized a drive was present, but the floppy EMU gets stuck in write mode. There's no reason the boot up sequence should be writing to the disk. Something was wrong. On these machines, the PR number six command is supposed to tell the ROM to boot from slot six, which is where the floppy controller is. But the machine was just sitting there. This controller has a jumper that allows you to select the disk density. It also has a quick, are you there sort of diagnostic, selected by putting the jumper in the middle or just leaving it off. Sure enough, the card came up in this mode and displayed the jumper setting. No good leads here, unfortunately. I thought maybe it was the DOS 3.3 boot image I was using. Fortunately, the EMU has a ProDOS image on it, so I loaded that and gave it a try. Unfortunately, no luck. The same thing was happening. I tried a couple different cycles and got various error messages, but simply couldn't get it to initialize. It would go into write mode and refuse to do anything else. I began to wonder if the floppy EMU board was acting up. I hadn't used it in anything else. So I took it up to our makerspace and hauled out one of the Apple IIs out to test. It worked perfectly. I had to conclude the problem was with the Franklin, most likely in the disk controller. 
a few weeks later. Through the magic of eBay, I scored a spare controller. That will work just fine for what we're doing. Okay, let's get the machine out. We're going to replace the theoretically bad controller, or demonstrably bad controller. Uh, we're going to pull this controller. Easy to identify because this has open headers right here, a little bit malformed. That's fine. Take that guy out. Our new controller. Note that this controller has the correct jumper in place. That says we are running at the correct track density. And let's go ahead and put this in one, two, three, four, or five slot number. Well, slot five, but let me put it in slot number six here. Because we're starting number. And again, these are keyed connectors. So uh, the good thing about this controller is it does not, it actually has guides. So you can't actually plug this in backwards. Or you could, I suppose, if you're really kind of a jerk about it. But let's not do that. Guy is in there now. We're cabled up again. Always a good idea to make sure that you have insulation underneath there. Uh, let's see what happens. I powered up correctly. The screen says Ace 1000. And uh, the boot. Let's load a disc. Track 0, 140K, DOS 3.3. Wonderful. In theory, with that mounted and that in slot number 6, should be able to go PR number 6, and it will boot. Activity light. I see tracks reading. Yes! Yay! It booted! Unbelievable. Now that I had the floppy EMU working, I could use some of the disk images I had downloaded. One of them was the diagnostic disk from the Franklin CX, a version of the Ace that was never released, but essentially had the same hardware. I used the diagnostics to put the machine through its paces to make sure we didn't have any other surprises. All these tests passed. I even let the memory test run for a good half an hour. It was time for the next step. My main goal here was to get CPM booted on the ACE 80 board. Doing so would let me run Turbo Pascal. Some of my earliest professional programming was done in this environment and I was itching to play with it again. Let's power up here. CPM disk loaded. That doesn't look good. It went into 80 combo mode, which is good, but that's a monitor drop. So, that's not so good. Let's see what else we can do here. After a little research, the problem was easy to determine. The ACE 80 board on a Franklin in this installation is currently residing in slot 1. The CPM binaries don't like it there. They really want the card to be in slot four. So after I moved the card, CPM booted up just fine. Naturally, this meant I needed to move the disk controller over to slot six, which is where it should have been in the first place.
In the early 80s, commercial compilers were expensive and slow. In 1983, Borland released Turbo Pascal, a 49.95 development environment with a lightning fast compiler. It combined an editor, linker, and compiler all in one inexpensive tool. In essence, an early IDE. Turbo Pascal under CPM quickly established itself as a high performance, low cost development platform. The fact that it ran so well on CPM cards in Apple's meant it was very attractive for young programmers like myself. It was my preferred environment for many years. Running it again here on the machine I first learned it on was a great experience. After telling the floppy EMU to swap out the boot disk for Pascal, I started up the environment. Turbo Pascal has its own built-in editor. The keyboard commands for it followed the standard for business applications in the day, WordStar. While lacking some basic features that we take for granted now, such as inline syntax checking and automatic formatting, the ability to flip in and out of the editor and immediately get feedback on your code was awesome. Here, I'd forgotten that Pascal uses single quotes rather than double quotes. It was just a quick edit and recompile, and everything was fixed. Compilation is almost instantaneous, something unheard of at the time, let alone on an 8-bit microcomputer. Thanks for watching. If you like this video and would like to see more, please click the like and subscribe button down below or leave a comment. We'd love to hear from you.